In this series of lessons, we're studying the Bible doctrine of salvation, talking about how humans can be saved to restore their relationship with God. So in that sense of the term, there's perhaps nothing more important that we could discuss. But in the study so far, we've had two lessons already. We've discussed two important concepts. In the first lesson, we talked about how the New Testament speaks of salvation in three distinct ways. First of all, in the New Testament, you can read people who make the statement like, I have been saved. And of course, that's the point where a Christian looks back and at a point in time when they put their faith in Christ, God saved them by his grace. So it's a past event. But if you study carefully, you'll find other ways salvation is talked about. Salvation is also discussed in the New Testament as an ongoing event or process, if you will. And we looked at some verses where people would speak in terms of I am being saved in the present tense. So it's an ongoing process, God taking that saved individual and continuing to deliver them as they move forward in life. And then finally, the Bible also speaks of salvation as a future event. And a Christian looking ahead in time, and he says something to the effect, I will be saved. And of course, that's focusing on the ultimate reality of what God desires for that saved person. Well, some may look at these various statements and say, well, the Bible is contradicting itself, itself. That's not it at all. It's just salvation is a broad a topic, and it can be looked at at several different angles. So they all fit together in the, the life of a, one, of a person who is saved by God. Each statement is true regarding salvation, depending on the angle from which you are viewing it. Then last week, we emphasized how salvation is a God-centered process. And we looked at it from God's perspective in a lot of ways. We learned that salvation is God's will for us. It's God's work in us. It's God's goal for us. It's God's choice for us. It's God's gift to us. And then finally, that it was God's pleasure to save us. So from every vantage point, this is a God-centered process. Biblical salvation is centered in God. That's the foundation of all that happens to us. In today's lesson, we're going to focus on the cost of salvation, the cost of salvation. Now, if you've been with us through the previous two lessons, you may be thinking, well, hold on just a minute. I thought you said that salvation is a free gift from God. Well, yes, I have mentioned that several times already, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to emphasize it once again. The Bible is clear. Salvation is a free gift. That's why it needs to be God-centered. Here's just a reminder of at least four places in the New Testament that speaks of salvation being a free gift from God. In Romans chapter 3, verses 23 and 24, Paul writes this, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. So we're all sinners, and the only way we're going to be justified, according to the Apostle Paul, is as a gift by the grace of God. Then in Romans 5, verse 17, in the midst of that discussion there in Romans 5, where Paul uh, contrasts Adam and Christ, here it says, Romans 5, 17, for if by the transgression of the one, speaking of Adam, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. So those who avail themselves of the gift of God, and here it's referred to as the gift of righteousness, uh, that's again a synonym, if you will, of salvation. Paul says clearly it's a gift from God. Then perhaps the clearest verse in the New Testament about salvation being a free gift from God is in Romans chapter 6, in verse 23. Paul contrasts the wages of sin. He says the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. One more. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. Ephesians 2, 8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. And that's an important distinction there to make. Paul 
it says it clearly. It's not of ourselves. We've been saved by grace through faith, not of our doing or our merit or our earning. Paul clearly says to the church in Ephesus, it is a gift of God. So once again, I'll emphasize as strongly as anyone else that salvation is a free gift. To deny that is to go fly in the face of so much clear Bible teaching. Remember, if you are saved, it's not because you've contributed anything of value to your salvation. In Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6, notice what Isaiah says. Isaiah 64, 6. For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. And all of us are like, all of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. So in contrast to a holy, righteous, and God, even our righteous deeds are just like a, a filthy rag or garment. That's, you know, how a holy God would view any attempts to merit any favor from him. If we're saved, it's not because we've contributed anything of value to that process. If we're saved, it's not because we deserve it. I'm reminded of the words of the prodigal son who finally comes to his senses in that story in Luke 15. Remember what the son said in Luke 15, 21? It says, and the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Those are words all of us would echo as we return to the father. It isn't like we come with, with uh, loads of, of merit. No, like the prodigal son, we make our way back to the father with nothing to offer, even unworthy to be called the son due to that. So if we're saved, it's not because we deserve it. If we're saved, it's not because we've earned it. Remember, Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life. So if we've earned anything in life, it's death because of our sin. Salvation isn't something you can earn by virtue of the fact that we're sinners. So if we're saved, it's not because we've earned it. If we're saved, it's not because we can afford it. Salvation isn't a gift to be purchased. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 26, remember what Jesus said? It says, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? That's a rhetorical question there. And the answer is clear. You can't give anything. We have nothing to give in exchange for our souls. Anything of value we have counts as nothing. So if we're saved, it's not because we can afford it. You can't be saved. You can't obey enough, rather, to be saved, although obeying is important. You can't pray enough to be saved, although praying is important. You can't sing enough to be saved. You can't give enough to be saved. You can't read the Bible enough to be saved. And all of these things are, are important in the Christian life. Obedience and prayer, worship and giving and studying the Bible. I wouldn't downplay those things at all, but doing those things aren't going to bring us salvation. All of these various activities we just mentioned are vital for a healthy spiritual life, but none of them are the basis or ground of our salvation. If you will, we could say our finest efforts do not merit the tiniest sliver of salvation. Some seem to have the mistaken notion that salvation is a 50-50 deal. That God does his part and man does his part. I don't think that's biblical. Especially in view of what the scriptures we've already read. Some mistakenly describe salvation as humans doing their best and then God making up the difference with his grace. That's not so. Salvation is either 100% God or nothing. That's what makes it a gift, right? Now, some may not be accustomed to hearing salvation spoken of in these terms. I grew up in a religious fellowship that, although it would have made the statements I just talked about, the way they taught kind of led one to believe that, yeah, there's 
a part by which we have to earn this, but it's not true. Perhaps it makes you uncomfortable to think of salvation as a gift, even though the Bible clearly teaches it. Now, some at this point may be thinking, well, are you saying then that there's nothing a person must do to be saved? No, that's not what I'm saying or implying. If a person was saved simply by God offering the free gift, then all would be saved, wouldn't they? If that's all it took, if there was no response on the part of human beings, if salvation is a free gift, then, then uh, everyone would be saved. But you know the Bible doesn't teach that, do you? The Bible teaches that not everyone will be saved. That's just the reality, because not all will accept the gift. The Bible also teaches that any person who desires to be saved must receive or accept God's gift through active faith. When people in the days of the apostles heard the gospel and asked what they needed to be do, needed to do rather, they weren't rebuked for asking a silly question, were they? You know, when Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, Peter and the rest of the apostles preached on the day of Pentecost, and the people cried out, Brothers, what must we do? Peter didn't say, Oh, now hold on. There's nothing you can do. Uh, here. No, he, he went on and told them what they needed to do. So yes, there is a response called for on our part. The salvation isn't part, isn't based part upon what we do and what God does. No, the response is, of course, just by faith accepting the gift. We'll talk more about that in some later lessons, more in detail. But for now, just remember that it's God's effort that saves us, not our own efforts. Yes, salvation is a free gift offered by God. But remember this very carefully. Just because salvation is offered freely, it doesn't mean that it comes cheaply. And there's a difference, isn't there? Just because salvation is offered freely, it does not mean that it comes cheaply. Salvation is accomplished and offered to you and I by God at a tremendous cost. Notice how the Bible describes this cost over and over again. Let's look at just a few verses out of many that we could talk about that just highlights this fact. Salvation is based in the efforts of God. It's centered in God, but it was a tremendously costly thing. Perhaps a verse known in Scripture more than any but other verse, you know, even by those who wouldn't claim to be Christians, would be John 3.16. But you remember what it says? John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, shall not perish, but have eternal life. God loved the world, and making a way for the world to have eternal life came at the cost of God giving his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, took the death of God's son to secure salvation. That makes it very costly. First Peter chapter one, verses 18 and 19. The apostle Peter knew just how much cost was involved. He witnessed the crucifixion of Christ. Notice 1 Peter 1, verses 18 and 19. Peter there writes, Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your feudal way of life inherited from your forefathers. So, you know, even the silver and gold are perishable things, spiritually speaking. We may put value on them, but Peter says, No, you weren't redeemed that way. What? At what cost were you redeemed if you're a Christian? He goes on in verse 19 to say, but you were redeemed with precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. Jesus had to shed his blood for you to be saved. What a great cost he paid. In 1 Corinthians 6, verse 20, Paul reminds the Christians in Corinth, he says, you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. You see the relationship there? There was a price paid 
again, for their spiritual freedom from sin. And on the basis of what God did at such a great cost, Paul tells these Christians, you ought to live in a way that brings glory to God. Why wouldn't you want to do that? Someone paid such a price for you or for me, then that ought to bring a sense of, of indebtedness because of that great price. A chapter later in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 in verse 23, once again, Paul reminds them, he says, you were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. So not only does he remind them of the price paid to help them in that endeavor to glorify God, but as he says here, the price that was paid ought to encourage us not to give in to become slaves of other men, spiritually speaking. Remember what Jesus himself said in Mark chapter 10 and verse 45. The Savior himself, Mark 10, 45, said, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus paid the ransom price. We were held hostage by, the, by Satan in our sin. Satan had the power of sin and death till it was conquered by Jesus. But it took the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus to effect that freedom. In 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9, Peter, Peter highlights the cost from the vantage point of, of Jesus. 2 Corinthians 8 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. Of course, the illustration here is powerful, isn't it? Jesus left, if you will, the riches of heaven. At the Father's side, the Son of God gave up everything to become nothing, humanly speaking. He gave up riches. He became poor so that we could be rich. That sounds like a, a, a transaction that's weighted in our favor, doesn't it? Jesus gave it all up. Now he's gone back and ascended to the Father and retaken his place at the Father's side, but in the interim, it was very, very costly for Christ. Second Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, speaking here of God, it says, He made him, or Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So once again, you see the transaction, right? Jesus was rich and came, became poor for us. Here, the picture Paul uses is Jesus was sinless, yet he took on sin in the sense of when Paul says he became sin on our behalf. Jesus didn't sin, but he all the sins of the world were heaped upon him. But he did that so that we might become sinners we, we sinners might become the righteousness of God. Again, the transaction waited far in our favor. In Galatians 3 and verse 13, it's again speaking of the cost, excuse me, speaking of the cost from the side of Christ, it says Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So not only did Jesus have the sins of the world heaped upon him, but as it says here, he became viewed as a cursed person. Finally, Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. This summarizes it really well as far as the price paid for our salvation. Speaking of Christ, it says, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking on the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Again, that's just a sampling of many, many other verses we could look at that just shows just how costly this rescue effort of God was. Yeah, it's a free gift to us. We don't do anything to earn it or merit it. 
but that doesn't make it cheap. It came at a great cost to God the Father. It came at a great cost to Jesus, his son. Hearing these numerous verses reminds me of the refrain of an old but familiar hymn. If you grew up singing church hymns, you no doubt sang this song. I believe the title is Jesus Paid It All, but I just want to read the, the, the refrain or the stanza. It says, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. That verse there, that's, that uh, refrain of that hymn, summarizes all these verses we just talked about. Jesus paid it all. We didn't pay anything to be saved. All to him I owe. Just as Pete, Paul emphasized there in a couple of places we read, due to the price that was paid, we owe a great debt of Christian living and service to God, our Savior. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. That's not 50-50. That's not 75-25. That's not even 99 and 1. It's all God and none of us. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. We can only become clean of our sin. We can only be white, washed white as snow because of what God did in offering salvation through the death, burial, and resurrection of his son. Praise be to God for his amazing and costly gift. We sp speak and sing of amazing grace, and rightly so, but uh, we need to praise God for the price he paid, and that tells us something about ourselves, how highly God views us as his creation. God wants a relationship with you and I, and he'll pay any price to make that happen. I'm reminded of Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. We'll finish with this verse. The end of that, near the end of that chapter, Paul says, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? Notice the point he makes as he goes on. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? See the point being made there? If we see a God who was willing to pay whatever necessary, even to the point of not sparing his own son, allowing his own son to be crucified, if God goes to those lengths, sparing no expense, then why would we ever doubt that God will continue to provide whatever is necessary for those who put their faith in Christ? Once again, praise be to God for his amazing and costly gift. God bless you as you continue your studies. Reflect on what God has done for you if you're a Christian. If you're not a Christian, then consider what God is offering you freely if you're willing to accept it. God bless your studies. I hope you have a great rest of your week.